Well, hey guys, Hobby Friday. For the Q&A today, I'm gonna to answer your questions about the recent article that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association regarding systemic absorption of chemical sunscreen ingredients. If you're not familiar with this article, I will go into detail about what the article showed and what its implications are and uh, what it means in today's video. But to give you a little bit of background, in the United States, our sunscreens are regulated as drugs, not cosmetics, and therefore they are under a little bit more scrutiny than, say, a scented body lotion that you might get at Bath & Body Works in terms of demonstrating safety and efficacy. Sunburns, particularly in early childhood, are risk factors for subsequent development of skin cancer. And if you're not aware, it is May, and May, in fact, is Skin Cancer Awareness Month. But skin cancer is the most common cancer in the United States, and about 3.3 million people per year are diagnosed with skin cancer. So efforts aim to prevent uh, skin cancer and lower incidence of skin cancer are really important. And sunscreen use through the prevention of a burn is one such is one such way to do that. <clears throat> and not only are sunscreens effective for preventing a, a burn, but the FDA concludes that there is sufficient evidence that sunscreen use can uh, be preventative for lowering the development of pre-skin cancers called actinic keratoses. These are something that we see every day in dermatology and are a bulk of what we treat. Also, in addition to prevention of pre-skin cancers, there is also sufficient evidence to support that sunscreen use can prevent the development of a non-melanoma skin cancer called squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. And the FDA has issued guidelines for industry in encouraging them to demonstrate through maximum usage trials systemic absorption of sunscreen ingredients. And if shown to be absorbed systemically at levels greater than 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, then the FDA requires that they perform additional toxicological testing. But these non-clinical toxicologic tests of carcinogenicity and fetal embryo toxicity can be waived if during uh, maximal use uh, clinical trials, the ingredients do not reach steady state of 0.5 nanograms per mil or greater. And so the most recent study that was published in JAMA is looking at chemical ingredients in sunscreens. There has been a lot of scrutiny and concern about absorption of chemical sunscreen ingredients for quite some time now. And if you're not familiar, chemical sunscreen ingredients are basically anything that is not zinc, or titanium dioxide that is listed as an active ingredient in your sunscreen. It includes things like avabenzone, octocrylene, oxybenzone, to name a few, as well as a capsule. And we've known for some time that these ingredients are in fact absorbed systemically and detected in, in the body. There was a study in 1997 that demonstrated this, as well as one in 2008. So this really isn't like new information. Um, but the study that was published in JAMA by Mata et al., just to give you some details on the study, it was an open label, randomized, four group pilot study that looked at 24 healthy adults. And the aim was to determine systemic absorption and pharmacokinetics of sunscreen ingredients, specifically the ingredients avabenzone, oxybenzone, octocrylene, and ecampsol. They examined absorption with maximal use, as is encouraged by the FDA to do. And what that means is that they had participants apply two milligrams per centimeter square of sunscreen four times a day to 75% of their body surface area for four consecutive days in a row. Each group received a different combination of active ingredients in either a cream, lotion, or spray vehicle. These are the most common vehicles sold in drugstores and what have you. And they subsequently found evidence of systemic absorption of all four ingredients, meeting the FDA requirement to then trigger safety data. All four of the formulations that contained avabenzone, participants using those formulations had greater than 0.5 nanograms per ml on day one 
and through day seven. So remember, they only used the sunscreen for four days, but the sunscreen ingredient, avabenzone, was still detectable at day seven. So this suggests there's some persistence. And this was shown for all of the products except the cream. So it was shown for the lotion as well as the spray, but not the cream in terms of the persistence. And the concentrations increased from day one to day four, suggesting that there is some element of accumulation. In terms of the other ingredients, oxybenzone and octocrylin were shown also at 0.5 nanograms per ml and demonstrated rising plasma levels um, with ongoing use, similar to avabenzone, and persistent levels after discontinuation out until seven days. This suggests an extended half-life of these ingredients. Among the six individuals using a capsule, the ingredient a capsule, five had a capsule uh, greater than 0.5 nanograms per ml on day one. So in effect, what the study shows is kind of what we already know is that these ingredients are in fact absorbed systemically and specifically with maximal use. So heavy handed two milligrams per centimeter square, which is the amount of sunscreen you need to apply to ever actually get to the SPF on the label. <clears throat> and to a large body surface area of 75% four times per day. So that's like several grams of sunscreen that um, these individuals were applying. And the study showed <clears throat> that they are detectable at systemic levels. But what I think is really upsetting to me is the way that the media took this study and these study outcomes and went wild with them and promoted these headlines of fear and phobia around the detection of these ingredients in plasma. The detection of these ingredients does not imply that they are toxic or harmful. They merely trigger the threshold of the FDA for further testing. So nothing as, as of yet says anything about these ingredients being unsafe, harmful, dangerous to human health. And we have no we have no reason to believe that these ingredients are harmful to human health, but only further studies down the road will, will help, to, help to affirm or refute that. So the sunscreen manufacturers need to actually show that systemic absorption poses some sort of risk to human health. Not using sunscreen poses a, a risk to human health in the fact that you put yourself at risk for a burn and through skin damage from the effects of UV exposure that subsequently sets the stage for skin cancers as well as photo aging. Other gaps in knowledge that the study does not address is the impact of different, different formulations in different vehicles in terms of systemic absorption. It suggests that probably there are differences in the, simply in the fact that sprays seem to have, high, um, seem to have higher absorption than creams. The study also doesn't address um, activity level, exposure to sun, uh, water, how all of those other conditions might impact systemic absorption. And everyone in the study was a healthy adult with, with no skin disease. So in other words, we don't know if uh, skin that is got, say for example, eczema and a little bit of an impaired skin barrier, how that might affect systemic absorption. And this is all looking at adults. So it, it does not address how levels, how high these levels may get in children and infants. Children and infants have different ratios of body surface area to overall skin, and, and therefore their absorption is, is likely much, much different. So at this point, we can't say anything about systemic absorption in children. So I want to make that point clear because I saw a lot of headlines that are like, sunscreen could reach dangerous levels in your baby. And like, that's just fear mongering. Um, you know, we don't have any evidence of that in children yet, and we don't have any toxicologic data to suggest that these ingredients are harmful to your children. So earlier this year, the FDA put out some proposed changes to the way sunscreen labeling might be altered and, and some proposed changes to sunscreens. And I overviewed those in a separate video. I'll link it down below for you guys. But if you'll recall from that video, they wanted to take and take more of a careful look at the safety of individual sunscreen ingredients. And they came up with this uh, generally regarded as safe and effective terminology. 
At this current moment, generally regarded as safe and effective or GRACE, um, the only sunscreen ingredients that the FDA now considers as GRASE, G-R-A-S-E, are going to be zinc and titanium dioxide sunscreen ingredients. Those are the physical sunscreen ingredients, not the chemical ones. They, however, based on this study by Mata et al. and JAMA, the, the ingredients avabenzone, oxybenzone, octocrylin, and acamsol, they now need to, to go on and do the toxicological studies before the FDA will consider them GRASE, G-R-A-S-E. So the next step is the toxicologic data. And industry has until November of 2019 to provide this data, which I don't know, that sounds like a tight deadline and no pressure. But my understanding is that the FDA will extend this deadline if so long as they, they submit, I don't know, some sort of evidence that they are in fact doing the testing because, you know, understanding the limitations of chronology and, and getting good, good data. So I, I imagine that that is not a hard fixed deadline, but it is pretty, it is pretty close. November 2019 will be here in, a bat, in the bat of the, the eye. And if these manufacturers do not provide that toxicologic data, that safety data, then what does that mean for the US sunscreen market? These sunscreens could be removed. Um, from our market. So in other words, you may no longer, theoretically, if they, either if they don't provide the data or they show data that it in fact is harmful, then these ingredients will be removed. So you may not have, you know, your sprays, your chemical sprays, your sunscreens without any cast, without any, you know, that blend in the skin or more cosmetically elegant. Um, so that is, that's kind of alarming that that could happen that rapidly. You know, obviously, if they provided data that these ingredients were harmful, it would be a shock to me. Um, but, you know, that would certainly support taking them off. But if they don't provide that data and then they have to take them off the market because they don't provide the data, that's a little scary. Like, these are ingredients that have been shown to prevent skin cancers and pr protect you from a burn. Like, taking them off of the market, it saddens me because what we would then be left with are zinc and titanium dioxide only sunscreens which, you know, they are, they are good at protecting against a burn, I'll say that for sure. Um, but you all know from my videos about UVA is the other wavelength, the other wavelengths of light that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily responsible so much for the burning, but they penetrate deeply and suppress the immune system and age the skin and contribute to wrinkles. They cause hyperpigmentation and they, they play more of a, they play a major role in skin issues in people of darker skin types who don't really burn as easily. So those are the rays that, that everyone needs to protect their skin from but darker skin types in particular. And zinc and titanium dioxide sunscreens, they do a good job at the UVB, and they'll do a good job at UVA, so long as they are applied at a sufficient density. And go back to my video on high protection mineral sunscreens, and you'll see what that looks like. It is a very, very, very noticeable white cast. So this is not a great option for people of color to protect their skin. If that is all they're left with, I mean, that is not, that is not gonna be, that's not gonna be acceptable to the public. People are not gonna want to walk around with that kind of white cast. So they're very unsightly and no one's going to use them in a way that offers the kind of protection that you need. Bottom line, at this point, as always, Protecting your skin from the sun is more than just sunscreen. It involves avoiding peak sun exposure between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., although here in Texas it is sunny much earlier and goes out until 8 or 9 o'clock at night. So another, another uh, methodology that you can do is to check your UV index. That gives you a, a snapshot of how likely you are to burn at any given time because it shows you what the UVB is, but it doesn't give you any information about the UVA rays. It's just another tool though that you could, you could use in terms of gauging when is a safe time to go outside or not. Wearing broad brimmed hats, sun protective clothing, glass sunglasses, but I will insert a snapshot here of really what, what good sun protection looks like and what inadequate sun protection looks like. So you can see that. 
And then this was a maximal usage study. Uh, so again, they're applying sunscreen at a density of two milligrams per centimeter squared surface area four times a day to 75% of their body surface area. That is a ton of sunscreen four times a day. Um, and you know, that is actually what you should be doing if you're walking around all day in a bathing suit. That's, that's probably, you know, actually kind of correct as to what you should, that, that's what you should be doing. But if you take a step back and look at it, you really shouldn't be walking around in a bathing suit all day with that much of your skin exposed, relying on sunscreen. So in, in real life, you are probably, your maximal usage is probably only going to be, even if you're doing it right at two milligrams per centimeter square, it's really only going to be maybe 10, 15, 20% of your body surface area, not 75% of your body surface area. Um, because, you know, the whole total picture of sun protection is more than just sunscreen. It is sun protective hats and clothing. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want this article to scare you. It's not showing anything new. The media really misrepresented it. And I've seen headlines like, you know, could be potential, you know, gets to dangerous levels in your children's bloodstream. It's like, it's back the bus up, like showing that it's present in the systemically does not imply toxicity. I mean, also many of you are curious about the ingredients that are in sunscreens in Europe and in Asia, all over the world that we don't have here in the States, like Tinosorb, for example. When are we gonna get those? Well, manufacturers will have to do these maximal use absorption studies, just like they have to do here for, you know, the ones that they're doing now. And if those, those ingredients are shown to be absorbed systemically, then they will also have to perform the toxicologic and safety testing. So they will be met with the same level of scrutiny. So in summary, today, we just know that these ingredients are absorbed systemically. It's not something new to us, it's something we already knew, and it does not imply that they are not safe, uh, and that they are dangerous. So the sun and excessive sun exposure are dangerous to human health in that causes burn, burning of the skin and skin cancers, and you need to take appropriate measures to protect your skin from excessive unnecessary UV exposure. And that includes not only wearing sunscreen, but also sun protective behaviors like hats, gloves, long sleeves, and avoiding going outdoors during peak exposure hours. But if the absorption data does not sit well with you and you are resistant to use sunscreen, do know that zinc and titanium dioxide physical sunscreens are generally regarded as safe and effective, so you can feel good about using those. I personally have no issue using all types of sunscreen um, and I, I feel good about using them. And at this point, we have no reason to believe that they're not safe. Uh, simply because this paper showed that they were detected in the body does not imply that they are not safe. It just brings some new things into light and, um, you know, things that need to be further tested. But at this point, protecting your skin from the sun is, as always, imperative. So I hope this video was helpful to you guys in addressing your questions about the article. Uh, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. As always, don't forget, subscribe and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.